So, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a nice night and morning this day, Saturday. My name is Tobias. I'm the co-founder of the Blender 3D School, and we also host the Blender Day every year. It's a German-speaking event in Mannheim. Uh, professionally, I'm a full-stack developer, and I also teach software architecture to students at the Corporate State University in Mannheim. Yeah, and as you guess, UST is exactly my topic because uh, there's a lot of in for me to understand and to learn about it. And today I would like to give you some kind of observations that I made and I will also cover the different pieces of software that is currently available in the Blender universe. Okay, um, whenever you have some more background knowledge that exceeds my knowledge, please uh, just give me a hand. We have a microphone here and you can just uh, yeah, share some knowledge. So I would like to learn about it also. So you are invited to have the talk together with me if you like. Okay, with that being said, Let's have a look to the outline. I will just give you some motivational slides, the purpose a bit. Then we will go over the different software pieces of the USD Blender ecosystem. Um, beyond that, there is a lot of more that USD is offering and I will try to explain it with Blender terms. So maybe it's easier for those of you who are already familiar with Blender internal stuff and how the stage is organized and everything. And then we will have a look how well other DCCs, so DCC is digital content creation software, so as Blender, um, how well other DCCs are playing well with USD. So if it's a pain or it's very easy to export stuff using USD to other DCCs. And finally, some closing remarks on the future of USD, according to my opinion. Okay, um, please keep in mind, USD has been invented for those guys. So, you have a large production crew, many departments, many artists in each department, they have to talk to each other, they have to share resources, they have to share assets. So whenever you get the impression, why is USD doing this, then remind yourself this slide. Because it's not for tiny teams or small teams, it's for the really big ones. And the assets somewhere are created and then start their path throughout the whole uh, project team. And this is also called an asset pipeline. As you can see here, we start as an ideation board, storyboard, we do some kind of block out, we make the modeling and so on. And the asset is just moving along the path. And those huge teams um, very easily run into a lot of problems if the pipeline is not setting up, setting up very um, yeah, tight and, and efficiently. And this is where USD has been invented for. And Steve May from Pixar once explained that a lot of 3D content has to be moved between different tools. And in those departments, artists are not only using Blender, of course, they also use other DCCs. So that means throughout the pipeline, the asset moves from one DCC to another DCC and so on. And with that, we have some challenges. So if artists work on the same project, even on the same file, then you have the problem of the last update wins. If two artists open the same file at the same time and one finish earlier than the other, then only the changes from the last one are saved and the changes from the first one are just lost. 
Then we have different TCCs that need to speak to each other. And we have several levels of done in our pipeline, assets. They start in the sketching phase, then they are blocked out, then they are been worked upon and then they are released, version one, two, three, and so forth. And of course, we have so many artists and nobody should be blocked because another artist is just claiming the file for himself or herself. So this brings us to the solution to decompose the whole scene into a lot of pieces. And this is what USD is made for, to provide a rich common language for defining and assembling and editing 3D data and to support multiple digital content creation applications. So this is the opening uh, sentence you can read if you go to openusd.org. USD also has some quite interesting features. It allows to edit other artist assets on top of those original asset uh, values without having any loss. So it's very nice to uh, work in a large team. And of course, we have a common language, so it's a, a common file format for the DCCs that can be shared among the departments. In July 2016, after huge success of Alembic, which has been made public by Industrial Light and Magic and Sony Pictures in the year 2011, Pixar released USD as OpenUSD to the public after 20 years of internal development. And with that, they also provided Hydra. I will talk about a little bit about Hydra in a couple of slides, and open subtiff. And um, they also provided a reference implementation for Maya and Katana. Yeah, and uh, just two months ago, the Alliance for Open USD has been founded by some companies. And um, fortunately, we have a talk about this today at two o'clock, um, hosted by Vincent. So if you are interested what they are doing, what is their purpose, then join us in the discussion. Just to give you some glimpse why it's important to have some kind of an open USD alliance. Even if so many different renderers are speaking the same language and importing the asset files, any single one of those renderers has its own opinion how to interpret the lighting values. And in some renderers, it's very bright, the scene, and in others, it's very dark. So we need some kind of committee who sets up those standards that were not already defined there. Okay, before we go more into detail, I would like to give you the main, most important difference between how Blender understands the stage and how USD is uh, structuring the stage. So, for example, if I want to create a forest scene made up of single trees, I would do it like this. In the lowest layer, I would have my materials, my library file, which is just defining the shaders. And then I would link those shaders to my asset file, where I just have the trees, the mesh data of the trees. And then I would um, yeah, have several types and versions and variants of those trees in my trees.blend file. Every rectangle you see here is a blend file and every arc that is connecting those blend files could be interpreted as some kind of referencing linking. And finally, on top of everything, I have the shot.blend, which is just assembling everything together. So this at least is the uh, uh, the stage or the, uh, the structure of the project I would um, start with. USD is a little bit different. USD has more pieces. As I mentioned, in USD we try to decompose the whole scene in little pieces. And we have one USD file 
Here again, in rectangle is a USD file. It's called layer. And we have one USD file at the bottom, which is, for example, defining the mesh data. Another file is defining the material. So this is somehow similar to Blender already. And then we have an object USD file, which is referencing the other two files. So it's some kind similar to Blender linking. And then the difference starts because then I have some instances files and those instance files can have overrides. So you can just say, okay, I will reference to another layer below, but I want to change this single property. And you can do it, it's called over. And in order to do it, you have to identify the asset that you want to override, and this is done using a naming system. This is identical to Blender, the names must be unique, and in Blender we have data blocks, and in USD we call it prims, uh, for primitive. So if you know which prim you want to override, you can do it. You can just say, hey, I want to override the prim, let's call it tree, and then we can add some other colors or some other uh, positions and transforms. And finally, we have the shot USD at the top again, which just sublayers, so integrates, assembles all the other instances that you have in your project. So as you can see here, we have more layers, we have more blend files, USD files. They are called layers. And this is not only the only difference to Blender, but I will come to this in a couple of slides. Okay, chapter two. Let's talk about some software pieces that are already available and that you can use. I will talk about the USD importer exporter, of course, the Hydra add-on and the Omniverse connector. In 2019, Sivrin Stuve makes his first steps into USD and he just tested how well you can export USD um, from Blender, so he was about exporting Blender, not already importing it to, to Blender. And he realized um, even back then, there is some kind of difference and different understanding of how this, the scene is structured. And he also um, had some kind of, yeah, he made up some, some very interesting observations, for example, USD likes to have ma many different pieces. Yeah? The whole scene is decomposed in many different pieces so that every artist can work independent of other artists on those pieces. But in his export, everything is in one USD file. Yeah? So this is some kind of a difference. And I don't know if this is a technical reason for this. But even if you want to decompose the Blender scene into many different pieces, you would need how to do it. And so this needs some kind of architectural knowledge of the departments and this the exporter cannot have. Another pro pro problem that uh, comes with this is supporting instancing. If you instance the same asset multiple times in your scene, then it would be great that you do not make them real and export them. So, because then you have a lot of copies of redundant data. And USD supports the scheme of references, as I said. So it would be great to export everything as far as possible as a reference. But if you do not have single USD files, then it's harder to reference them. And this is also, um, yeah, quite interesting from a software architectural point of view, and uh, Sebrin already discussed this back then in 2019. But the community was very happy with this first test, and there were lots of very nice comments, and, and they were very happy that he started testing USD, and with that encouragement uh, in 2020 in a version 282, Blender got its first USD exporter. This exporter was somehow limited, but it was working. For example, the hair was only 
exporting uh, parent strands and we had only perspective cameras and only alive particles. But nevertheless, it was the first time we could export stuff that we made in Blender as USD files. Yeah, and then I tested it. Here I um, have a black screen. Ah, oh, wow, there's a video, okay, cool. Um, this is an um, Amsterdam scene. Um, and this is the data from uh, Google Maps. You can nowadays import those data using the Blender OSM add-on. And yeah, this is the Felix Meritis, and I wanted to make some kind of nice smoke simulation. And I decided to test USD for it because um, I knew from further experiences and tests that the Blender fluid simulation is a little bit slower than in Maya. It's because for some reason we only use one CPU core for simulating the stuff and Maya uses all cores so it has some kind of advantage. And so I um, just exported everything to Maya and it was working fluently. It, it, it was like a brace. We had all the models, I had all the camera animation, I had the camera angle and everything and so I could uh, let Maya make what it can better than Blender and then I composited it back in Blender. So it was uh, working very great. Okay, let's go back to the timeline. In the following years we have some improvements up on the exporter and in 2021, we then also got USD import. Before it was not possible to see uh, USD files with Blender eyes, but now it was. And yeah, there were some limitations, of course, but yeah, I was very happy that we had it. Um, here's another slide where I had another fun project. Um, I created 17,000 cubes with a node editor. And what you should know about exporting uh, Blender to Blend files to USD is about the instancing. USD is very much about efficiency. And here, please keep in mind, if you want to have instancing already used in the USD files, you need to instance collections and not objects. Yeah? If you just duplicate link objects and you have 17,000 cubes and export it, then you have a very big file because everything is written as a copy, so after it made real. But if you just instance collections, then you will really have instances in USD, so it's very nice. Okay, let's go to the importer. A remark on the importer. Um, I created the USD um, yeah, structure as shown here on the left and if I open it in Pixar's own tools it works like expected. Um, again we have the mesh data which is instanced in several instances with some small changes. We call it overs in USD land and with the USD importer in Blender, you must be aware that somehow it loses those reference. I mean, there's only one mesh data here, but as you can see on the bottom right, the Blender outliner shows two different mesh data blocks. So it just copies the data right now, or this is the Blender 4 importer. And it also does not um, takes the right names from the prims that I have given. So my prims are called tree instance one and two, but for some reason um, the objects here in Blender, they are called after the mesh data. So this is something you have to keep in mind if you open very large scenes, because then your memory will, will be flooded very easily. I think it's just a thing that they can change in the future. Okay, what happened after 2021? 
we got more and more improvements in the material import and export. We now support UXP um, open VDB volumes. We, we got the USDZ exporter so we can uh, export ASCII data, binary data, as well as zipped data. So our USD files become smaller. We have improvements on hair and curves. And we also now import primitive shapes. So in USD, there are some kind of classes, schemes, and you, you can call it data types. And for example, there is a data type sphere. And you can have an instance of the data type sphere. And this instance only needs to explain its name, so its identifier, and for example, the position and the size, the diameter. You do not have to make any comments on vertices, edges, faces, normals, UV layout, because this is defined in the scheme file. And Blender, since uh, 3.5, is also supporting those uh, primitive shapes. So the USD files are very small, and you can import also those. And they are mainly used as collection volumes in for example, interactive applications, yeah, because there you only need roughly approximations of your high-level meshes, and then you often use very primitive shapes like a box or a, a sphere. So next week, when Blender 4 is coming out, then we have also skeleton and blend shape animation support, and now exporters can hook in. So those hooks are used if you export something to a, to a USD file, then Blender just notifies your exporter, hey, I'm ready to write it down on disk, and then your exporter can make some kind of changes. For example, as a reference implementation, they showed how they can export Material X. So this is a format which is also very common in our sphere. And we have also the Hydra Storm add-on coming to Blender and Hydra is it's a very nice thing. It's an abstraction layer between the DCC game structure and the renderers. So imagine if we have a lot of DCCs and a lot of renderers on the other side to make every body of those DCCs play with each render very nicely, you need a lot of software to write. Yeah, if you have N DCCs and M renderers, you need N times M software that does the interconnection. And Hydra is now put in the middle. So all DCCs now talk to Hydra, and all renderers also talk to Hydra. So and instead of N times M, we only have N plus M software to write and to, uh, yeah, to use in order to make it happen. And in Blender 3.1, mm -hmm. I also um, tried the Hydra add-on already. And you can just switch to the Hydra uh, renderer. And then you have a possibility to choose which render delegate you want to use. So render delegate is the connector from the renderer to Hydra. And in 3.1, um, they had the Pro Render Radeon uh, delegate chipped with the add-on. And back then, they also had some kind of a node system for USD files directly in Blender. You could just import uh, USD files and you could merge them. And then you could just connect them with the Hydra um, add-on. And the Hydra then tells the renderer how to render it. And for example, here um, I loaded the kitchen scene from Pixar. And yeah, it, it was working very well. Yeah, and it was very nice to see that if you uh, switch on the statistics, you see that only eight faces are in the scene. Yeah? Also, I see a lot, of, a lot of more here because it's directly going to the renderer. And this has some advantages with very large scenes because then Blender doesn't need to reference them in its own memory space. Yeah? So it's, it's some kind faster and you have some improvements on performance. Okay, this um, 
USD editor is not part of Blender 4.0, but the Hydra um, uh, software is, and it's now uh, comes with uh, Storm Renderer. The so Storm Renderer is a reference render from Pixar, which they use to check for all USD stuff. Okay, um, delegates for Hydra are popping up everywhere. So we have delegates for Arnold, Emery, even Cycles, Octane, Katana, Luxcore, Moonray, the Omniverse, RTX Renderer, ProRender, Redshift, Renderman, Storm and V-Ray. So it's very great and we can expect that all those renderers will play nicely in the future with Blender because of Hydra. Okay, let's come to another piece of software. It's the uh, Omniverse Connector and the Omni Omniverse Nucleus. It's some kind of exotic software because it's not made inside Blender, it's made from NVIDIA, but it deserves the right here to be named because it's a great piece of software. I, um, I have tested this and it's, it's working great. And if we are thinking back to the artists, they have to export all their files to some storage directory, right? And there's where Nucleus comes in. So it's just a storage for USD data. So in a big pipeline, you can have a local server, it runs the Nucleus application, and there you can export all your USD files, um, and so you can import from those um, Nucleus back to Blender or other DCCs. And what's very great about the software is that it has some kind of memory, what has been exported before. So two weeks ago, one month ago, it has some kind of regi registry and it knows, ah, okay, this guy already exported this asset and it changed nothing. So during export, we just set a reference to a USD file that is storing the asset. Yeah, so it's very fast because not everything needs to be exported again. It, it uses uh, references all over the place. And what I also did is to provide connectors for a lot of TCCs. Um, this is the Omniverse Launcher. You can install it and then you can have connectors for your favorite TCCs. And uh, so it's very easy to export to the Nucleus and yeah, I just talked to Vincent, they have a, a very nice pricing license uh, agreement. So if you are a small company, very few people and only two have to work together at the same time, then it's even free. Yeah? And for enterprises who have multiple um, artists working together, then it costs a lot of money, but for most teams it will be okay. They can use it for free. Um, for Blender, they are also about to provide that connector as an add-on, but it's not yet completely supporting all USD features, so it, it has some issues. So if you want to export to the Nucleus from Blender, it's currently the best way to use the Blender for Omnibus fork. So they provide a, a fork of Blender and there they have integrated that technology together with support for NVIDIA's material definition language. Yeah, and um, I was very curious how far it goes. And in July, Machine Gun Studio released the Persian Bazaar on the Unreal Marketplace for free. So they have some free assets every month with 250 unique assets and 40 prefabs, up to 4K textures. The meshes use heavily nanite and lumen for lighting. And it's a very huge scene. Uh, there are some kind of statistics on the right. And yet there you can see that you have 100,000 of prims, which are drawn. And they also provided some cameras and the cameras has some kind of uh, camera properties, for example, defocus that you can see here. Yeah, so this is a huge thing to export. 
and I just pressed export and was yeah, very happy. What happens then? That is cycles. So 90% of the scene was brought to Blender and here I could use cycles and I could render better images because of the global illumination stuff and path tracing stuff in cycles which is not provided in this fashion in Unreal. So I was very happy all the textures were there, all the models, the mesh data and even the lights, the skybox was there so I could just start rendering out all the stuff in Blender without having the hassle to export every tiny thing individually. Okay, um, now I would like to come to some USD concepts which are not yet supported in Blender and it's also very likely that they will never be supported in Blender because they are so strange and different from how Blender is organizing the scene. Um, you see here on the left side the Blender outliner and you have some collections. Collections could link from library files into the shot file and um, you can have collections in multiple Blender files and then you can assemble all of those together in one shot file. And on the right side you see the layering system of GIMP Photoshop 2D image processing applications and there we have in contrast to Blender the idea of order. So if you have a background layer at the bottom and a foreground layer on top in GIMP or Photoshop, then you will see the foreground above the background in the flattened image, right? But if you interchange it, if you have the foreground below the background, then the foreground will not be visible. So order suddenly matters. And this is what is USD is. Yeah? In Blender it's completely irrelevant if you have a collection on top or above in NASA, but in USD is, it is of very importance um, which order the layers the USD files have when you combine them together. And there's something else. In GIMP and Photoshop you have uh, combination modes so you can combine several layers together. For example, you can take one layer only the colors, another layer is, is just multiplying their pixels to the current stack. And this is also there in USD land and they call it composition arcs. So the combination modes are called composition arcs. And with that being said, we can go um, to dive deeper into some concepts of USD. We already know the term layer is just one USD file and it's similar to a blend file or a collection that is stored in a blend file. Then we have sublayers, which is similar to all contributing library files that we have in the Blender scene, which is not very similar or there's no term in Blender, is the scope. Um, scope is more like a grouping of, of assets and uh, in my opinion it's it's the closest is if you have the asset manager and in the asset manager you can set up sources where you have the collections that are assets and those sources somehow group together the same kind of assets for the same topic. So this is something uh, which is in USD the scope. On the left we have been now and, and now we change to the right and talk about the composition arcs, so the combination modes of different layers. The USD over is something familiar, similar to the library override we know in Blender. Then we have inherit, which is just using references. And you can have one source and you can reference it multiple times in Blender. And if you change some properties via Python, for example, of those instance, then it changes in all other instances as well. So this is in USD land and inherit, 
But they, has an, they have another concept, it's called USD reference. And here, those instances doesn't know each other. So you still use instancing, and you have multiple instances of the same source, but now you can set values for every single instance on their own, and they do not share them. And yeah, this is a nice uh, concept to, to very, uh, in a detailed fashion, set up your scene, your, your asset data. Then uh, there is a purpose in USD. Um, every asset can be assigned a purpose, and they have three types of purpose, guide, proxy, and render. And those purposes determine what is loaded into memory. So whenever you want to make animation with an asset, you can switch to proxy, then the high detailed meshes are disappearing and they are already unloaded from the memory. And if you just render your scene, then you have to use a purpose render. And you can choose this in edit time. So during editing, you can define, okay, from this asset, I want the proxy look, and from this asset, I want the render look, and from this, I want the guide look, or all together. And this is uh, what Blender is not providing in, in, this, uh, in this flexibility. You have to decide during import time which purpose you want to import to Blender. You cannot unload them whenever you want, like in USD, but the importer allows it that you say, hey, I would like to have all assets in their rendered version. Then you have variant sets, and this is a great, great um, idea. Um, here I also loaded the kitchen scene from Pixar in uh, the USD view. It's an application that ships with the USD stuff from OpenUSD. And here I zoomed into a pen. And variant sets is one asset that comes in different flavors. So the modeler and the, sh the shader artist, they just set up one single asset in different flavors. And the artist, the animation artist, for example, can now choose which of them he wants to see in the file. For example, a one type or a new type of the asset or an asset in different colors. And here I'm choosing just drop downs to switch the different variants of the assets. And here I also do it uh, for a can. And so this is a very neat uh, feature because then you can decide which type of, of look you want to have for your asset uh, in your current stage of working with the assets. Okay, then we have the payloads, USD payloads. Um, payloads are just data which is lazy loaded. So if you open the scene, the USD scene, then the payloads is not loaded with the scene data, but you can then define, hey, for this asset, I would like to have the whole payload, all the stuff, all the high quality stuff. And then you can just press a button and to unload it again. So it, it's not only becoming invisible, it's just also falling out of memory. And this is important if you have very large scenes, you know, that you have a limited amount of memory and then you need to unload stuff in order to make yeah, you an, a nice uh, experience with working um, the assets. And um, yeah, we have also the USD stage, which is somehow different to the Blender scene and, and stage um, implementation. And I already mentioned that the order is now important in USD land, which is not important or not considered in Blender. But there's something else. The different compositing arcs, they have different strengths, so they can override the values from other compositing arcs. And this they call liver piece. This is just an abbreviation for the order of compos composition arcs and L is for local stage. So all values that you define in the top most uh, shot layer file, it's called local and they override all others. Then you have inherits, then you have value sets, 
references, payloads and specializes. Okay, let's come to chapter four. Um, we did some research. How well is USD uh, playing well with other DCCs from Blender? And um, here, Gottfried, a colleague of mine, did all the very difficult stuff and he um, loaded um, all those uh, DCCs and, and tried, hey, can they consume my Blender exported USD file? And yeah, this is the result. Um, you, can, you can look it up if you use the link um, bit.ly slash beacon 23 minus USD, you can, you can come to this uh, presentation here. Okay. Yeah, no, I have the problem. I am not able to come back to my presentation. Wow. <laughs> oh, thanks for the help, hopefully. So let's continue, some real closing remarks. What's uh, coming up in the future? Of course, there is a lot of um, missing uh, USD features and there's also a prioritization um, from the demands of the community. And uh, I'm sure they will uh, have more and more features covered here in the importer and exporter in Blender. But of course, there will be other stuff in USD that we will never see in Blender because of the different types the scene is organized. But it's okay. I mean, we can load all the USD stuff and we can uh, write to USD. And as part of a pipeline, it, it still works very well. Okay, if you are interested in USD and you want to have some kind of introductory uh, notes, then you can um, yeah, click links on the left side. It's very nice to read through it. It's written in an in a easily understandable way. And if you like to have the heavy technical stuff, then you can switch to the right side. Um, we have uh, Remedy Entertainment. They wrote a book about USD because they built their own game engine completely around USD. And yeah, it's, it's very nice to read. It's it's, uh, it has a nice flow. And of course, you have the terms and concepts provided by OpenUSD. Um, there you can read what they, how they describe all the concepts that I, I, that I have um, also mentioned today. And um, if you want to look back where everything started, then you can find here the link to um, the blog post from Subrin back in 2019. I'd like to thank uh, all the developers who are supporting USD and it was very nice. Uh, I, I just uh, talked to them and they invited 
me to their developer meetings and they helped me out with all the stuff. So they're very nice people and I learned a lot. So um, thank you very much. And yeah, if you want to hear more about USD, then please join us this afternoon, two o'clock in the meeting room above. We will talk about the Open USD Alliance. Thank you for coming. Okay, in case you have any questions. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, what about shader conversion from, uh, from Blender to Houdini, for example? Okay, the question is what about shader conversion from Blender to Houdini? Uh, currently, the best thing you can do is to um, export everything as baked flat maps. So, um, some shader nodes are already um, supported in the exporter, but not all. So the best thing is, you, if you have a procedural a shader tree, make textures of it, make only one principal BSDF shader node, connect the textures to the node, and then you, you can be certain that it's exported very well to other TCCs. In the coming future, they will add more and more shader nodes, so that will be not needed any longer, but currently this is a kind of limitation. Yeah, sorry. The uh, Omniverse connectors, also a lot of them have built-in distillers and converters. So if you use the, um, the Houdini connector to Omniverse, it'll convert the materials. And then you use the, our, our build of, of um, Blender um, to import. It'll also convert back. So you can try the connectors if you're not getting a good, uh, good translation directly. So if I have a, a, a scene or a mesh made by geometry node in Blender, uh, is it keep aliving and importing into Omniverse, Omniverse like uh, create? Um, currently, um, you have the limitation that if you use geometry nodes to create instances, you need to make instances using collections. Yeah, in the geometry node, there is some instance point node, and there you can say, okay, I would like to instance a collection, and then you have, um, you can use uh, the concept of inheritance in the USD export. So it, it uh, brings the size of your f files uh, to very small, it makes them very small. Yeah? And the Omniverse connector, as well as the Blender built in exporter, is uh, doing the same here. So use um, collection instances and then it works. Thank you. Uh, what about animation uh, and deformers? Do do the USD exporter uh, like uh, supported all like uh, lattice uh, bones and uh, bend and simple deform, or do we need to cache it uh, in uh, like uh, uh, like an alambic way? Yeah, for uh, most TCCs, um, it it works by caching it as an as an alembic uh, mesh. But uh, in Blender 4, they also support a skeleton export, so you do not have to to render it out and, and make it flat. So you can also support the skeleton. So this is improving, but not everything is just supported, and not for any DCC. So, yeah, because I mean, it's not that only Blender is somehow feature incomplete. Also, other DCCs do not support all of those features yet. So there is some kind of trial and error. And you can check our uh, matrix we have uh, compiled to see which compatibility is there with, with your favorite other DCC beyond Blender. USD editor and um, USD exporter. Actually, you said that it's not going to be, I mean, Blender is not going to be an editor, but uh, we're able to export USD files. So what do we do in Blender? Uh, I mean, as I said, it's a simple question, but yeah, what's the difference? 
Uh, it's a very good question. Um, you have, um, if you have Blender in the Blender in the pipeline, then it's very likely that Blender is not for assembling all the other USD files together, but is just responsible for a single asset. And then you have no problem. You can just export a single asset. This is how USD would do it uh, anyway. So every asset has its own file uh, composing or respecting the, the structure of the departments. So for this uh, application, Blender is, is working very fine. But of course, you will not have the support of all other USD concepts that you would have in other applications. For example, Houdini is completely built around USD. So this is a, the most complex um, yeah, a coverage of, of USD features. Maya is also very well uh, doing it because when it was released by Pixar, they also um, provided a Maya implementation. So they had some kind of head start in comparison to other DCCs. Okay, let me just come to you. See, so, yeah, I was kind of just curious about um, the possibility at the moment to uh, introduce custom objects in USD, like custom data objects, or like in basically you've got all the like the meshes and cameras and stuff, which they like have properties and need to be reinterpreted. But like just to uh, yeah, just the, the feasibility and options around like if I just want to create my own little data structure and have that be passed around by USD and read by different uh, DCs. Is that like something inbaked from the start or, yeah? Yes, so D um, USD has been invented to be extendable, so you can define your own schemes and classes and then you can make instance of those classes and you have to provide, of course, to other DCs also the specification. So you can just make your own data types and use them which is also very nice and it's not, it's not there yet in Blender, so you cannot have it in Blender and maybe you will never have it in Blender, that they support custom um, objects, but maybe we will see. Oh, yeah. Just one quick thing about the question about editing and using Blender. Um, at two, I'll show how we use um, our drive sim team that does the autonomous uh, vehicle training system. Uh, drive sim is entirely built on Omniverse. Um, the whole team has switched over to Blender for all of their asset creations. So we'll be showing how we use Blender to create the assets, then Omniverse or drive sim in this case to assemble the environments and simulate the worlds. Uh, so it's a great working pipeline between the two. Okay, then let's wrap it up and have a nice day. Bye bye.